and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fosferin. The Royal Academy in London has been transformed for this year's summer exhibition, the world's oldest open submission exhibition, which means anyone can enter their work to be considered for inclusion. It's a wonderful celebration of art and artists and has taken place every year since 1769, shortly after the Academy was founded. The 2023 show, which has been described as an assault on the senses, features more than 1,500 works displayed across 3,000 square metres of galleries and will be seen and enjoyed by an estimated 200,000 people. Royal academician and celebrated British painter David Renfrey is this year's summer exhibition coordinator. His theme, Only Connect, taken from a famous quote in E.M. Forster's Howard's End. David has had more than 50 solo exhibitions worldwide and over the past five decades has become known for his large-scale watercolours of dancers and his drawings and paintings of neighbours and friends at the infamous Hotel Chelsea in New York, where he lived for more than 20 years. And today I'm delighted to be in David's Kensington studio, just a stone's throw from the Royal Academy, to find out how it's all gone. David, it's so wonderful to meet you. I am a great fan of hats and you are wearing (laughs) your iconic fedora. Tell me a bit about that. That's really become your... Well, this is actually the summer hat. I haven't found the perfect summer hat. I have a hat from Bates in Piccadilly. I have about 12 of them. They're all identical and different stages of decay. But I, I like a hat, you know. Yeah. How did you start wearing a hat? Have you just always worn one? More or less. I lost my hair quite early. I found that wearing a hat in London was more difficult because at that time, you people would poke fun at you and, and so forth. When I went to New York, People really embrace difference. And I liked it. I took to the hat like a fish to water. Well, it suits you. It really is your signature look, I think. And funnily enough, you mentioned when you moved to New York, you felt like that. When I moved to New York, I felt like if I fancied it, I could walk down Soho in a pair of pyjamas and nobody would bat an eyelid. It's a different vibe. It is. You would get compliments and pay compliments on the street, which is quite rare in London. Certainly was... Very rare back in, you know, 30 years ago. Oh, well, I'm looking forward to exploring your New York years there because (laughs) actually unbeknown to me until I started doing my research, we were actually neighbours at one point when you were at Hotel Chelsea. I wasn't very far away, just off West Broadway where the Soho Grand Hotel is. So it seems funny that we, uh, yes. It is, yeah. I lived in a tiny, it was called a a mini loft and mini was certainly the key word because (laughs) I could stretch my arms out and touch all the walls and, but it was the place to be, not like it was in obviously the 60s, 70s, when it really was an artist community. Right. But still a wonderful place for a young Grimsby girl to live uh, for a few years. A uh, northern lass. A <laughs> northern lass, not far away from your roots. Let's talk about the summer exhibition. How does it feel now that the doors are open and the public are enjoying presumably all that hard work that you put in behind the scenes? It's a great sense of relief. You know, we work at it for very hard for a period of about seven, eight months and you want particular pieces to be in it. I wanted it to be a big sculpture in the courtyard, and I was very keen that it should be by a woman. Of course, women artists are now becoming very, very successful, and so they, they, there was none available. You know, there was nothing available apart from the piece, the beautiful piece in the courtyard by Huma Baba called The Ghost of Human Kindness. The Ghost of Human Kindness? Yes. What a wonderful title. It was borrowed from a private collection in Connecticut, That's what visitors will see, plus the banner on the outside of it. But inside, I wanted it to be embracing all cultures, all people. What vision did you have? What was your aim? How did you want people to feel when they walk through those iconic doors? Well, when Rebecca asked me, it was out of the blue. I mean, I had given up hope of of doing it. Had you? Uh, Yeah, I'm 80, you know. So I said to Caroline, you know, it's not going to happen. And three days after having said that, the phone rang and Rebecca said, we hope you're going to say yes to this, but we'd love you to be coordinator of next year's summer exhibition. And how did you react, David? And what Uh, did Caroline say, your wife? She said, well, Rebecca said, would you like a couple of days to think about it? And I said, no, Rebecca, I I absolutely want to do it. Yeah, so uh, we were over the moon about it. It was an opportunity to do something that I've always wanted to do, which is have a overview of it and pick an idea and uh, work on that 
choose people to be in it. I chose the team that I had. And apparently it's the most cooperative, cooperative team for a long, long time. Wow. And are you only choosing, David, from people who submit work or can you approach artists and say, I would love to feature this? The majority of the of it is, is from what we call send in. So this year, 16,500 people applied to send in. We looked through 16,500 images of work which is a little bit mind-boggling at the end of it. You know, you, That's a task in itself. It is a task. You can't see anything at the end of the day. You know, you, you've just got these images <laughs> filled up your brain with images. So you have to make a decision fairly swiftly. We also invited a given number of artists that we thought really needed to be invited. And it's a mixture of that. And then the, role, the academicians themselves get to put, I think it's a maximum of six works in, 81 square feet. Gosh, <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I love the way academician just flows off your tongue because you're so used to saying it as a royal academician. It's taken me a bit of practice to put my teeth in for that one. It's a weird word and a lot of people find it difficult. <laughs> yeah. And it must be a great honour to be a royal academician. And then this must be the pinnacle of being such a key part of the Royal Academy. It's been lovely because of the interaction with others. And it's been lovely sort of stretching your hand out to others. I really love the send-in, you know, the people that send the work in. I did that 50 some plus years ago for the first time. And I know what it felt like. People have come up to me afterwards and saying, you know, hanging my picture changed my life. A woman, what? came up to me two or three years ago when I was curating a room and said, hanging that picture up, it just turned things around for me. And do you remember what it was like the first time you got a yes and the first time you saw a piece of your art hanging there? I was much more bolshy then, actually. Really? I wasn't that bothered. It was a thrill to have it on the wall. And of course, I did like it. But I, I was much more disparaging about the Royal Academy in those days than I am now. And frankly, it was much more conservative and much more dare I say, old white male dominated. We are moving. Slowly, aren't we? Yes. And about time. About time. Yeah. The microphone is <laughs> propped by Sonia Lawson. She said to me, I didn't want to vote for you, David. I wanted a woman to be in the academy, but I voted for you. So I want you to promise that you will do your best to make sure that more women are elected. I have kept that promise. Well, that's fantastic. And also it's a very diverse exhibition. Looking through my notes, I'm just thinking of the works that you've got in by Paul Dash, who was born in Barbados. And in fact, his work featured, didn't it, in Tate Britain's show of the Caribbean and British art last year. Lovely to see his work. I particularly loved it in that show. And I was not familiar with his work. And, and I saw it and I contacted him about it. I went to see it. He's the most darling human being, you know, I really... Is he? <laughs> yes, he's so fabulous. And his wife, the two of them are just amazing. And tell me a bit about Lindsay Mendick as well, because I think <laughs> she was a recent discovery in Margate. <laughs> her, her pieces are a bit cheeky, aren't they? They're very cheeky. As she says, they're ceramic adorned with willies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and a plethora of other plants and things. They are absolutely amazing works. In her exhibition in Margate, it was uh, tables with vaginas around them. And, and um, she also had a sculpture of herself sitting as she was talking to a priest and uh, confessing. And it was absolutely scurrilous. <laughs> <laughs> what was it that appealed about her work well, she's, to you? She, she, she is a breath of fresh air. I mean, she's amazing. Very dynamic. Just a lovely human being. The other installation that's particularly caught my eye, and this is from reading about the exhibition. I'm going in a couple of weeks' time, but I've loved the images of the installation of suspended fabric, which I think was by the Irish fashion designer, wasn't it? Was it Richard Malone? It was Richard Malone. We met Richard Malone years ago at, with Farshid Musavi, gave a dinner party, and there was Richard Malone. And we've been to all of his fashion shows and so forth. I, I recently saw something he'd done model walking on a catwalk and it's a photograph wearing this blue thing with sort of poles coming out of it. And I thought, that's not fashion, that's sculpture. So I contacted him and said, would you like to make something for the summer exhibition? And he was over the moon. We didn't know what he was going to come up with. He has made small sculptures, smaller sculptures but in this vein, but this was something 
way beyond that. And of course, you are able to contribute yourself to the summer exhibition if you're curating, which is amazing. Describe for me indoor cosmology. It's one painting consisting of 16 panels, which I began not as a large painting, but as a group of paintings which were based on chandeliers. But it gradually became the disintegration of chandeliers. And I was also reading Carlo Rovelli books about physics and time. So it all became intertwined with, with this idea of existence. I don't want to make it grandiose. Somehow in my brain, it's all about cosmology. And does it feel when you look at that work as if you're looking at the chandeliers from the floor? I'm just trying to picture it in my mind. How would you describe it? Very difficult to describe. It began individually, but when I'd done about four or five or six of them, I realised that it was one piece that was growing organically and it grew like that. There is a particular sequence where they all belong. And unusually, no people. It's all chandeliers, isn't it, in indoor cosmology? There are a few paintings with no people in them. I like the work very much and I like the colours that you've used as well. I mean, they're oil paintings, aren't they? They are. They are. And does that reflect three years of work for you? Is that yeah, correct yeah, so that, that, that it took that, that, that time that, to do it? That work is a work which has taken three years. Where did the original inspiration come from? From when we left the Chelsea Hotel. We had nowhere to stay when we went back there. So we used to go to Soho House. In the meatpacking district, yes. the original the New original, York one. Yes, yes, the original one. It has six glass chandeliers in its dining room. And I was a bit interested in them. And I made a few little sketches over the years. And it kind of bobbled away. I don't know how, I didn't know how I was going to use them or if I was going to use them. I'm really not that interested in chandeliers as such. You know, it, it's, <laughs> they're a vehicle for something else. So it probably stewed for about five years and, and I found some little drawings. I started making something from them and that's, it grew from that. And then also you've got, I'm looking for the name of it now because I've made so many notes, David, Flight of Fancy, which is a staircase installation, isn't it? Well, I, I feel a bit of a fraud because I'm not a lighting person at all, but I had an image of what I wanted people to feel when they came into the academy. I wanted them to feel as if they were sort of going into a theatre or you know, a music event. As you go into a theatre, lighting affects your senses in a way and prepares you for something. This is the, what I, I envisaged. So I took a photo of the stairs. I wasn't going to stand and draw it and put washes of colour on it. I thought, yes, I think that will work. Luckily, we have a phenomenal tech team at the VRA. Benji Fox was brilliant at this and everybody it worked with, and they more or less exactly replicated my idea. That must have been incredible for you to see it them was really, collaborate and see the finished product. Yes, it's really lovely. How does that feel when you visit now? I know you're only a bus ride away from the academy, but when you go, how does that feel when you walk up those stairs? Well, I, I enjoy it. I hope other people enjoy it. It seems fun. I've, I've always thought of the summer exhibition as fun, and some years it's been less fun. This year feels like it's packed full of fun. And as one critic said, which I was meant, I'm sure, as a compliment, was an assault on the senses. Which oh, yeah, is, I hope so. Which is a real compliment, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, I hope so, yeah. You seem like you have a really mischievous fun side to you, David. I'm like, afraid I do. You do? Well, that's, <laughs> that's good. When, when we arrived, you said that you dance for an hour every day. That's a lovely thing to do. Yeah, well, it's either that or plus that, a good long walk in the park. I mean, yeah. I walk to the academy from here. It's, it's no distance. It's not far, but what sort of dancing do you Afro do? Afro beats. Afro beats, how have you got into that? Oh, I listen to music, you know, it's and part you like of my it. culture. Yeah, do you find as well as probably keeping you fit, it's just is a relaxing, good for the mind and... yeah. It's nice to switch off sometimes, isn't it? It is. I would imagine a mind like yours is buzzing all the time with ideas. Yes, I can't stop it. It's really annoying at night. <laughs> <laughs> when it just keeps going. Now, your chosen theme is only connect. I'm going to show that I didn't really pay attention much in my English literature classes because I do know it's a quote from Howard's End, but I don't really know what it means. So tell, tell me the thinking behind only connect. It's really a quotation from the, the heroine of the story, Margaret and her soon-to-be husband, a businessman, not really interested in spiritual side of things. So she's sort of rehearsing something that she's going to say to him, how one should connect the day-to-day -day aspects of one's life with the spiritual side. And I, I thought it 
could be applied to, in a broader sense to everything, really. We have unprecedented ability to communicate with each other, and yet we're probably more fractured in our whole existence. I want a reconnection, human connection. Are you troubled, David, by how disparate people have become? I, f- I feel that too. Incredibly troubled by it. I think of grandchildren and think of young people and think, what are they inheriting? Inheriting a lot of needless hatred and needless discord. And as you say, ironic in a way, in a society which has really become, in a negative way, 24-7. We never switch off. We're bombarded on social media has its place and can be a wonderful place, but we're bombarded, aren't we? I wouldn't want to say negative things about social media, but it's difficult to not say that it's now being used to such an extent that it excludes everything else. So a mother or a father walking in the park, the pushchair and their child will be looking at their phone young children walking around looking at their phones. You walk down the street, hardly anybody is looking around. Or well, passing the time of day, everybody's got headphones on, haven't they? Yes. Even on bikes and scooters, everybody's yes. headphoned up. They're not inherently wrong, but the f- fact is that there is no switching off from it. No, we've kind of lost that sense of community, I think. And, and I know for you, people really is... What you love, isn't it? People like me, people are at the heart of of everything. I'm unashamedly in love with the human race. (laughs) Me too. I think that's why I became a journalist. Because I think it's (laughs) interesting to be able to tell people's stories. And it doesn't matter to me whether they're well-known or famous or or the man on the street. Everybody has a story. And it's wonderful. That's reflected, I think, a lot in your work. I mean, who'd have thought, David, taking you back, to 1964, when you packed up your paintings in a van in Hull and you headed down to London. Who would have thought this extraordinary career that's unfolded would have happened? Do you remember that day when you packed up your van and I headed do. south? I do. I was very mischievous. I married young, way too young, and I thought my wife was going to London for two weeks. I bought a van. I had no money, but I bought a van for 50 pounds. I borrowed that easel in the corner from Hull College of Art. It still belongs to them and it will be returned. <laughs> At some point. I don't suppose they're in a hurry for it. I'm sure um, they're honoured you've still and, got it. Um, they made me sign out for it. And I told my wife I was going for two weeks. I was going to find a gallery. That's what I said. So as I was going down the Great North Road, I'm never going back. <laughs> That's incredible. I didn't know. I didn't know until I set out. But were you sort of going off to try and find your feet and yeah. find your career in a city that hopefully would welcome your art? And Yes. Was I wrong? <laughs> well, you definitely were not wrong. You certainly were not. But it took a while. I'm sure it did take a while, but I'm a Grimsby girl, David, and I like the fact that despite the fact you were actually born, I think, in Worthing. Oh, I hope you wouldn't, hoped you well, wouldn't bring that up. You see, yeah, but you see yourself as a whole boy, don't you? Yeah. I am I am a Hull man. That is my hometown. Both my parents are buried there, my younger brother's buried there, my sister still lives there. I love the place. I really love it. But other places become your where you're meant to be, I suppose. Yeah, I think it's the same for me. I, th- I left Grimsby when I was 17, but I'm still a Grimsby girl and I have lovely memories. You'll appreciate this. When I was a little girl, the treat, if you lived in Grimsby, before the Hump Bridge, obviously, was to get the ferry and go to the department store, of which I can't quite remember its name, but Hull had a department store. Hammonds. Hammonds. It had Hammonds. My, my ex-wife used to do polyphotos in Hammonds. You know, yeah, you know, like, you won't know what polyphotos are, but it was like a sheet of photos of, uh, and you turning your head and then one enlargement. Yeah, I think I do remember. I remember those, I think. The- there was Hammonds, there was Thornton Varley. Oh. Ah. Uh, there's another story. There's another one, but I can't I remember. I don't remember that, but I remember Hammonds. And I remember with my nan and my granddad. I still remember the sound of the, is it the horn on the ferry? But I still remember yes. the sound. Yes, oh God, it was wonderful. crossed over. New Holland. New Holland, yeah, from the ferry yeah, terminal. Yeah. So I love the fact you've still got roots there. You've just... Finished an exhibition in Lincoln, which I still see as very much part very of much. my world. And yeah, I love yes. the fact that you've kept that northern connection going. Northern soul. Yes, northern soul. And there's a lot to be said for a northern soul. And I wanted to ask, because I saw a lovely interview you did at the recent exhibition with a young lad, and he was over the moon to be talking to you. And you were telling him about your paintings of dancers from the exhibition A Moment Captured. And you told him that you became interested in figures in motion while you were in Hull. And you described the club scene in those early days 
It was edgy. Hull could be a rough place back in the day. There were a lot of fights and you wouldn't want to look at someone too long. Are you looking at me? <laughs> <laughs> you want a photo. <laughs> <laughs> but I developed a very good memory for things. And that's really what started my interest in, in dancing. What was it about the people dancing and the motion and the movement that captured your imagination? It's hard to say. Dancing is a great pretext for putting people together in a work. And another thing that I've discovered about my work is I like to have people who are off kilter. A moment later, they would fall over if, if, <laughs> if they didn't move their leg. Laurie Anderson's got this song called Walking and Falling, where she describes this act, you know, you're actually walking is almost like an act of falling, but you stop it from falling by placing the other leg forward. So I'm interested in people on the edge of falling over. <laughs> <laughs> and that interest, of course, developed, didn't it, when you were in New York and you lived at the Hotel Chelsea on West 23rd, I think for the best part of 20 years. It was 20 years. More than 20 years. Having lived in New York, I know a little bit about Hotel Chelsea and over the years, some of the extraordinary people, including yourself, who lived there, I mean, people like Bob Dylan, I think, lived there, didn't he, at one point? And Bob lived there, rambling Bob lived there and Patty Smith lived actually Patty Smith lived in our first apartment that we had which later became my studio when we found another apartment with roof garden I can't even remember the names of the people that lived there but what was it that made it such a draw for artists what was it like living there what was the feel like it was built in 1883 with artists in mind so it had 12 foot ceilings on the top floor and there were studios, there were proper studios upstairs. Yeah, it was a community. And you painted a lot of people you met, didn't you? Whether they be neighbours, dancers. Everybody I met. When I was first there, I was complaining to Caroline that I don't have any models here. I don't know anybody. It was a very hot summer. And she saw this young woman on the other side of the street walking by with Bob, black hair and a black cat tattooed on her arm. She said she'd make a great model. Caroline was eating a Rocky Road ice cream and it was pouring down. And she, <laughs> just, she ran across and said, my husband would like to, to do a drawing of you. Would you, would you sit? And she said, yeah, of course I would. But I'm going back to Boston now. I won't be back till September. She took our number and we thought, you know, she became not only a really terrific sitter over many, many years, but still a very, very dear friend. If I dare say what she, she was a dominatrix. That was her career at that time. She's no longer a dominatrix because she's in the museum world. <laughs> <laughs> she's gone a bit more mellow in her, she's mellow. In her old years. <laughs> and did you just love the whole New York vibe? I adored it. Yeah, every Saturday I went to Union Square and sold potatoes with a friend of mine, a farmer friend, not for money, you know, He'd give me some potatoes, but I, it was just for the banter, just for the kind of like the hell of it. And I, I did that from Saturday mornings. It was my... God, I wonder if I've ever bought potatoes from you because you were there. The three years I was there, I was there from 2000. And Union Square was a regular haunt for oh, me at there. the weekend. So you were, pro you were probably there. My favourite thing, this will sound a little bit tragic, but one thing <laughs> I loved doing because... You know, I was this kind of Grimsby girl planted in New York. When I moved there, I'd never been. So it was I was working yeah. as a journalist. And on a Saturday, I liked going to the laundrette with a book. If you live in a pump in New York, you don't really have a washing machine. No, no. So everything smells clean and fresh and you don't know who you're going to meet. So I'd go off, get a little takeaway coffee, get a book. I know, and sit and, do, and the smell, when you walk down those streets in Soho or Chelsea, the smell of fresh laundry. And I loved all of that, that. I didn't know anybody. I became friends with the doorman at the Soho Grand because I didn't know anybody and I'd pass. And you know, when you say everybody's got a story, all the people that stay there, they don't pass the day, time of day much with the doorman. They had fascinating stories. One had a charity in Africa and- Isn't it wonderful? You've got to talk to people. You've got to you? talk to people. My dearest friends, Brooks Ogden, Caroline was in London, I, I was there and Brooks asked me to dinner and it was late. And I knew I had to get a taxi to get up to 8, 81st Street. And there was no taxi. This taxi stop, I see one in this taxi stop. And he said, it's the end of Ramadan, I'm starving. 
He said, I, where are you going? I said, 81st. He said, oh, I'll take you. Anyway, so as we, he turns, spins the cab around, and as we're going, I said to him, so what's the first thing you're going to eat? He sort of beams and turns around for far too long for, for, for driving a cab. <laughs> <laughs> he holds a plastic box up. I said, they look like samosas. He said, they're not samosas. They're like samosas. They're not samosas. And he says, have one, take one. I said, I can't take, I can't take what you're waiting. So he said, I said, you can break a little bit off. So he breaks a piece off and gives me this not samosa. And it's delicious, but it's that beautiful interaction with people. Around the corner from where I lived, there was a lovely cafe and I'm sure it was full of creatives. It seemed to be full of photographers, artists, models. And it was one of those wonderful places where as a newcomer who didn't really know anybody, you could happily sit there with your breakfast and not say anything to anyone or just you'd end up in a random conversation. Yes. But you felt comfortable being yourself. That's what that's what I fell in love with at New York. I thought I can absolutely be myself here. Nobody cares. Absolutely, Helen, that is exactly it. It gives you the license to be what you want to be. Which is a wonderful thing, I think. What made you leave in 2016? We would never have left, but the hotel was sold against the owner's wishes. He'd done some infringement and the other shareholders were able to get control of it. When they got control, they immediately sold it to a horrible developer whose aim was to get everybody out. Oh, what a shame. And so eventually it was resold and they started engineering leaks on people. And Caroline saw this happening and said, we have to get the stuff out of here. Time to go. We couldn't find somewhere else to live. We had a lease for life. Did you? Yeah. Oh, my God. Stanley gave us a, wow. a lease. At the same rent. So it's rent controlled. Really. It was rent controlled yeah, amazing. for life. Amazing. So uh, got to get the stuff up. So we, there was no alternative to ship it back t- to here. So it went into Caroline's mother's house, bless her. You know, it's a ton of paintings, massive amount of stuff. But two weeks after that, they engineered a leak that was so severe that it, the ceiling in my studio collapsed. It was so bad. So if the work had been there, Everything that I'd done would have been destroyed. That doesn't even bear thinking about. There is, I've got a little short movie of it. It's horrible. Thank goodness that you got out when you did and that you did have two decades of what I would imagine were very special times. Very special times. And I'm loving being back in London. I feel so creative when I'm, I think I'm a creative person. I can't draw to save my life or paint, but I like being in your studio. You've got beautiful work on the walls, with high ceilings here. Just looking at your paintbrushes, the tubes of paint, it, it kind of inspires me. But where, David, did that love of art come from originally? You know, did you draw as a child or? Yes, I drew from the get-go. You know. Did you? Yeah. As a young child, my father used to make beautiful Christmas cards, weird and wonderful creatures on, on it. Drawn he, creatures. Drawn. Yeah. And he drew cars. And only recently I discovered that he won a drawing prize from school where he went to. But it wasn't that I drew incessantly. He would say, go outside in, you know, in the sunshine now. And I always wanted good quality paper. I don't know where it came from. No. And were they pencil drawings you were doing in those days? Pencil and colour pencils. And was your mother creative at all? Did any of the creative side come from her, do you think? Not so much. I think the best side of me comes from my mother. Yes. What's the best side, David? <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> well, it would be unfair to my father to say, it's the love of other human beings, I think. She was a, an amazing person. And did she love people? She did. And that their stories? Yes. And- my father said, your mother used to love dancing, but he said, I have never danced with her. We don't dance, so she stopped dancing. And the only time I ever saw her dance was when I danced with her at my son's wedding. When she was special very, moment. She was very, very frail and ill and didn't live very much after that. They must be treasured memories, are they? It was Sort of beautiful. Mm, gosh, I can imagine. Where comes the point, though, David, where as a child you're drawing and drawing in the sunshine, where comes the moment when you realise that actually this might be something you can do for a career and do for a living? Was it anybody that spotted your drawings in those early days that 
gave you the confidence that actually this is really quite good? A couple of things, really. I actually knew that I was going to be an artist about the age of nine. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew that I was going to be one. At secondary modern school, Eastfield Secondary Modern School, the art teacher, Mr. Bainbridge, held up one. We had horrible paper in those days, just post-war, really, so it was sugar paper. Colour got lost on it. It was hideous stuff. But anyway, I made this, this painting, and he held it up in front of the class and said, Remfrey has made this, and it's like a Chinese watercolour. I had no idea what the Chinese watercolour looked like, but I sort of had this feeling of immense pride about it. In a way, it was a little help for me, affirmation. So when I left school, the only direction was art school. And did you enjoy your time at Hull Art, art College? I, I battled all the way through it because I, they were beginning of what they call basic design. And I was not bloody interested in <laughs> <laughs> And I only wanted to draw. I was in the life room drawing. That was what I was there for. I was fortunate enough to have one tutor who took me under his wing called Gerald Harding, who made me draw at arm's length and sight size, told me to beware of my facility. And he was very big on integrity and these things. And it turns out that he was transformative in a quiet way. And what about the painting? When did you start introducing your watercolours and oils? And Well, it was a little bit of watercolour, but it was oil that I worked on for a really long, long time. Pretty soon. And then after college, was that when you got in the van and you came down to London? Yes, to, yeah. And you had your first solo show in 1973. So yeah. that was fairly, well, I suppose that was, that was quite a good few years yeah, after know, getting yourself established, almost, wasn't almost. it? Almost, Ten years. almost a decade, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. And at that point, did you think that you have arrived and that this was no. it now? Or does an artist never really think that? I don't know. Actually, it was Michael Andrews, the artist Michael Andrews, that introduced me to the gallery that first gave me the show. And I got through to Michael Andrews through William Coldstream. You know, when you leave art school, you know, you feel, oh, okay, I'm on my own. But there is a time when you want some kind of critical assessment or some kind of to know where you're going, know if you're going in the right direction. I picked up the phone and, r and rang the Slade, Sir William Coldstream, and he said, come in, bring some paintings. And he was just lovely, and he liked it. And he said, I, I want to put you in touch with Michael Andrews, another wonderful artist with whom I became friends. And it went from there. It went from there. That's amazing. What's really great, I think, is that... Here you are, established and very well known, very successful. But th through curating the Royal Academy, you're able to champion unknown artists and change people's lives because that's what the exhibition, as you said earlier, does do. It would be overstating it to say it does it for everyone, but it's certainly a huge boost for many, many people to get in. But definitely for some, it will be life-changing. Now it's all done and everything's hung and everybody's enjoying it. Do you sometimes just stroll down and go and have a wander around by yourself? Well, Axel Ruger, our marvellous chief executive, said that I'm the academician who is most frequently there. I love the place. I love the people that work there. I know their names and I love the schools. You taught at the schools. Well, you? you taught is kind of overstating it. I was <laughs> professor of drawing there for two years. That then, still then, sounds then. a very nice, <laughs> nice role to have. And, was, and giving back. I think giving back is important to you. Giving back is very important. Just like to end on what you do now. I mean, how often do you paint now? Is it every day? And we're here in this beautiful studio. I draw every day. Filipino Lippi said, a line every day, and he didn't mean cocaine. <laughs> and you still get the same enjoyment, I'm guessing. It's obsessive. When I'm not doing the summer exhibition, I work for at least eight hours a day. Eight hours? Gosh, that's surprising. That's a long time, isn't it, eight hours? I think it's quite a long time, isn't it? Caroline says I've got to take weekends off, but I haven't. Oh, hang cracked, on. So we're talking cracked, eight hours, seven days a week? <laughs> yeah, something oh, like that. Oh, my goodness. What did Caroline think when you took her and she saw the finished exhibition? Was she oh, blown she, away? She's indispensable. She makes things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. She tells me I'm very lucky, but I really know I'm very lucky. I'm sure, and I think it's good she tells you as well, just, just to remind you. Um, she says I'm spoiled. Too. You're spoiled. Well, you're every bit the person I thought you'd be. I've watched a few interviews, and I think what I really like about you, David, there's a real gentleness about you. You're a true gent. 
you're so approachable and lovely and warm and humble. And it's so lovely to see that when somebody's had such huge success. And thank goodness that, you know, you're 80 and they picked up the phone and you've, you've yeah. curated the summer exhibition about blooming time. Thank you so much, David. I'm chuffed. It's been great. Thank you, Helen. It's I been- hope you've enjoyed it. I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Good. You've been listening to British painter David Renfrey, who coordinated this year's summer exhibition at the Royal Academy in London. The exhibition is on until August the 20th and is such a treat if you get a chance to go. And you never know, actually, if you spot a lovely young man in a black fedora, you might see David looking around the the galleries and halls. Download our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. Thanks for your company. I'll be back next week with another great guest. So join me then.